Good morning, everybody. My name is Alex Barthet, uh, and today we have a webinar titled How to Stop Work If You're Not Getting Paid, and It's Not What You May Think. Um, Ariella is out at a meeting today, so she's tasked me with running this, uh, this webinar. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So today's agenda um, is about how to deal with the problem of not getting paid on a job and talking about one specific remedy, and that is picking up and, and leaving the job. So step one is we have to define exactly what the problem is. Uh, next, we're going to look at what your contract terms say that you may or may not have the right to do. This is a very important step in the process. We'll talk about securing your lien and bond rights because if you do pick up and leave, you wanna make sure that you've secured your right to be paid. We wanna to check to see if there are any guarantees that you gave um, in the process. It may not change the ultimate decision, but we wanna be aware of all of the issues that we may face. Uh, if you bonded the job, I'll talk to you about what to say or not to say to your surety. We'll talk about the importance of documenting everything that's happened on the job, ideally from its inception through the point uh, and time when you may decide to pick up and leave. And then we'll talk about what may come next, which is the fight that will likely ensue as a result of um, you leaving the job. As always, if you have any questions, we'll take those at the end. Um, you will see the go to meeting chat box uh, you can go ahead and submit your questions. Uh, make sure not to include any names uh, of people or companies in your questions. And again, as I said, we'll take all those questions at the very end. So step one, let's define exactly what the problem is. Um, sounds pretty simple, right? You're doing work on a project and you're not getting paid. Um, now, the teaser in the title was, it may not be what you think um, about picking up and leaving a job site. And that is because I find that many clients that come to us, uh, they say, well, I'm not getting paid, so of course I have the ultimate and unilateral right to stop working. Um, and they are shocked when I tell them that may not, in fact, be the case. And as a result, they may have to take a different approach than what they originally considered, which was just picking up and leaving. Um, and knowing that, knowing that you don't have the unfettered right to stop work, no matter what your contract says, because you believe that Florida law says that you have that right, um, again, that's not the case. So let's take a look at how to analyze this problem. So we need to take a look carefully at what you agreed to when you signed a contract to perform work on this project. So what does your contract say specifically about the right to stop work? Um, now, we review many contracts uh, several a week, uh, whether that's a general contractor's construction contract, a subcontractor, sub-subcontractor, terms and conditions on a purchase order. Um, and we see a term like I'm about to show you now uh, in most contracts. Now, the one that I have here is between a subcontractor and a contractor, but it also exists in construction contracts between owners and contractors. So in this sample, in this provision, it says subcontractor shall diligently proceed with the work during any dispute even as it relates to payment or changes, the existence of a dispute shall not be grounds for any failure to perform by subcontractor. What does this mean? This means that if you've signed a contract that says that you are going to continue working throughout the course of a dispute and you will follow the dispute resolution process, that means that if you're not getting paid, if your change orders are not getting executed and funded, you do not have the right the legal right to stop work um, as a potential remedy for the non-payment. Your right is that you have to keep working, 
keep paying your employees, keep paying your vendors to have materials delivered to the job site, and follow the dispute resolution process that's outlined in the contract, um, which may be um, a meeting of the principles and then a mediation uh, and then litigation in court or arbitration. Again, it's not the ability to stop work. There's another provision that we see that also creates a problem. So you're, let's assume you're doing work on a project as a subcontractor and you're not getting paid. And the contractor tells you, well, you have to keep working. And by the way, the reason you're not getting paid is because we're not getting paid by the owner. Um, that if, if you have a pay when paid provision in your contract, then technically the contractor is not in breach of the contract with you. So it may be hard to, to believe, but if you've signed a contract that says that the contractor doesn't have to pay you until the contractor has been paid and the contractor hasn't been paid, the contractor is not in breach of the contract. Here are two sample sections of valid and enforceable pay when paid provisions so you know what they look like. So one says payment from the owner is a conditioned precedent to payment to subcontractor. The bold and underlined terms condition precedent are the magic is the magic language that has to be in the provision. There's another way to write it and that is payment to subcontractor is contingent upon contractor's receipt of payment from the owner. Again, the bold and underlined term contingent upon has to be in the contract. So the courts have construed uh, pay when paid provisions and they've determined that it is, if it has this magic language, condition, precedent, or contingent upon, they will be valid. So you may be upset that you're not getting paid, but it may in fact not be, not a, uh, raise, rise to the level of a breach of contract on the part of the contractor. So while this won't necessarily help you for a situation that you may currently have pending, in the future, you want to include an affirmative right to stop work in your contract. So you can add a stop work provision in your contract. So here's a sample. Subcontractor can slow or stop work without liability or penalty if it has not been paid its draw request in 30 days after submission. Now, you may not get an owner or a contractor to agree to a term like this. Maybe it's instead of 30, it's 45. Maybe instead of 30, it's 90 days. But having the right to stop work if you're not getting paid is very important because it reduces your risk on a job. It may not get you paid, but it at least stops the bleeding. So I would encourage you to the extent that you have uh, an ability to negotiate your contracts in advance of signing them. And, and I would suggest to you that there's much more of an ability to negotiate your contracts than you even perceive. Um, uh, that you include a right to stop work. As to the contract, let's close with, with one last issue. What if your contract says nothing? What if it's a simple uh, purchase order? Um, it doesn't say that you have to keep working. It doesn't say, and, and conversely, it doesn't say that you have the right to stop working. Um, generally, in that situation, the law uh, would suggest that if you are you've agreed to provide materials, uh, labor, materials or labor to a job site in exchange for payment uh, on specific payment terms. If you are not getting paid consistent with those payment terms, then you do have the right to stop work because the other side would have materially breached the contract. So I wanna be very clear about this. If you have a, a contract, maybe it's an oral agreement, maybe it's a short version uh, of a purchase order and it does not have a pay when paid provision and it does not have the right to stop work uh, or the right or the obligation for you to continue work, then if you are not being paid consistent with the terms of your contract, then you likely do have the legal right to stop work. That's why looking at the terms of your contract is the most critical first step for you to undertake. So with that behind us, let's talk about securing your lien and bond rights. If you're going to make uh, a move to stop working and you're owed money, then 
you need to make sure that your right to get paid is secure. So let's run through briefly what those obligations are that you have to comply with in order to timely perfect your lien or bond rights. So for some of you, this may be uh, pretty straightforward, but it's always good to review it. So number one, you need to serve a notice to owner within 45 days of your first work or delivery of materials on the project site. Now, if you have a direct contract with an owner, you don't need to serve your notice to owner. I still recommend that even if you have a direct contract with the owner, that you send a notice to owner, but it's not required if you have a direct contract with the owner. After that first step, um, you need to then record your claim of lien or serve your notice of non-payment, which is the uh, bond claim, no later than 90 days from your last work or delivery of materials to the project. So let's talk about this 90-day period. 90 days is not three months, right? Uh, some months have more than 30 days. Some months have fewer than 30 days. So 90 days um, is not exactly three months. So you need to count the number of days. Now, the 90 days includes weekends and holidays, except where the 90th day falls on the last uh, day. So for example, if uh, as you count the 90 days, you're gonna count every weekend and legal holiday um, in between. And if the 90th day lands on a Saturday, you roll it to the Sunday, uh, which then rolls to the Monday. And if Monday was a holiday in which your clerk's office was closed, which is typically a federal holiday, but some counties are a little different, then it would roll to the Tuesday. Um, and that's how long you have. You can always record your lien or serve your notice of non-payment before the 90 days. It doesn't have to be on the 90th day. And it can be while you're doing work. Sometimes we have clients that want to exert a little more pressure on the owner or the contractor. So during the course of the job, they serve a, a, a notice of non-payment or they record a lien. So just know that you don't have to wait until you're off the job to do that. What is last work under the lien law? Um, it does not include punch list or warranty work, but it does include approved change order work. Um, so keep an eye on when that last date of work is so you don't push past the 90 days accidentally. If you have a direct contract with the owner, then you have this additional step. You need to serve a contractor's final affidavit, which is a document that is signed and notarized by you that lists who the owner is, who you are, how much you're owed, and who and, and which parties uh, underneath you, your subcontractors, um, are still owed money on the job. That has to be served on the owner, not recorded, served on the owner, at least five days before you file a lawsuit to foreclose on your lien, which gets us to the last step. You need to file suit within one year of the recording date of the claim of lien, or if you have a claim against a payment bond, you need to do that within one year from your last work on the project. So there's a slight difference between those two claims. Don't confuse the two. And I would suggest to you, you shouldn't be waiting anywhere near that long um, if you're gonna pursue your legal rights anyways. We have an app that will help you calculate uh, these notice to owner and lien deadlines. You can get it uh, for your iPhone or your Android phone on the App Store or the Google Play Store. Um, if you just search in the App Store for The Lean Zone, T-H-E-L-I-E-N-Z-O-N-E. -E -E. There it is on the bottom right of the screen. If you just search uh, in the App Store for that, you'll find our notice to owner and lean calculator so you don't have to count on your fingers anymore when the 45 and the 90 days expire. All right, step four, check for any guarantees. Um, who do you owe money to on this job? If you're gonna pick up and leave the job, again, if you're not getting paid, it may not make a difference, but you should at least have an understanding of who um, you owe money to on this job. Did you provide a guarantee to them? Uh, did you personally guarantee a debt? So maybe you have suppliers that are owed money and you have a 
uh, a personal guarantee on that uh, line of credit with the supply house or with a bank. Um, again, it may not change the decision to stop work, but the important thing is that it shouldn't come as a surprise to you later that you may get sued personally uh, by someone that you owe money to. Uh, uh, did you personally guarantee the performance in your contract? We don't see this all too often, but we see it enough that it should be of concern. Um, we represented uh, a electrician on a project in which he didn't did not provide a payment and performance bond, but in lieu of that, the contractor demanded and our client agreed over our objection, by the way, to personally guarantee performance of the contract. So at the bottom of the contract, there was a paragraph where he personally guaranteed the performance of the contract. Um, so be aware that that's a possibility. Does that exist in the contract that you have? If so, you have to be very careful. Um, as a, and again, as I said, it may not change your decision about stopping work, but it's at least important that you have a understanding of what obligations you have to other people uh, on this project and your business as a whole. Step five, if you bonded the job, now is the time to talk to your surety before you leave the job. So some of you that may be contractors may provide uh, a payment and performance bond on your projects. If you're subcontractors, you may have provided a payment and performance bond uh, to the contractor and possibly with a dual obligé bond rider to the owner as well. If so, you need to understand what obligations you owe to your surety and what position they may take if you decide to pick up and leave the job. So the way you have to analyze this is you have to look at the terms of the bond. Not every bond is the same. There is no um, uniform bond. Every bond is slightly different and each bond has its own notice obligations. What are those notice obligations? And it has the owner um, complied with them um, or not? Did you personally guarantee the issuance of the bonds? You probably did, uh, and you may have, your spouse may have also had to guarantee the bonds in a document called the General Agreement of Indemnity. Um, that would have been the document you uh, and your partner and your spouses may have executed when you got your bond line initially. Those documents are very one-sided. They are typically non-negotiable. Um, and what it does is it, it gives the surety, your surety, the right to pursue you individually if they suffer a loss, um, even a threatened loss. You never, ever want to surprise your surety. Your surety should not find out about the fact that you left the job because they get a bond claim. If you're going to move forward with this conduct, this action to pick up and leave the job and you bonded the job, you need to talk to your surety and your surety agent in advance of actually doing it. Again, it may not change your decision to do it, but keeping your surety informed will minimize your risk on the job. Next, document, document, document. Documentation is absolutely critical. Um, and ideally, you will not just start documenting on this job when you decide to leave. So before you leave, you should determine how well have you documented this job um, from the beginning? What do the emails say? Uh, do you have lots of pictures? Do the pictures support your position uh, that you were not the fault of the delays on the job or the issues on the job or the reason for non-payment? Have you taken videos? Um, do you have access to all of these emails, pictures, and videos? Are they backed up? This sounds strange, but we've had clients who have had cases that uh, have fizzled because the vast majority of their documentation was lost because they were either hacked or a hard drive crashed. So you should have a, a, a robust backup strategy in your office for your data to make sure that if you need to resurrect information that you have the ability to do it. 
Something that's often overlooked is meeting minutes. What do the meeting minutes say? They're usually not written by you, and you and your team may not normally uh, or routinely review it. But do, do the meeting minutes support your narrative of what's happened on the job? I would suggest to you that they may not, and you may not even know it. Um, so, for example, if you attend the weekly uh, or biweekly meetings and you're constantly complaining that issues are, are holding you up and that uh, the job is delayed because of other people and you can't get your uh, folks onto the job site, uh, whatever it is you're complaining about, are those issues properly reflected in the meeting minutes? Because if they're not, fast forward a year in a, in a legal fight, what is it that the judge or jury is going to look at? You're going to say, well, at this meeting, I was complaining about these issues, but there's nothing in writing to support it. So if you get meeting minutes, uh, if there are meetings and there are meeting minutes, do the meeting minutes support your position? And if they don't, then you need to send an email following your receipt of the meeting minutes. Uh, and by the way, if you're not getting copies of the meeting minutes, you need to request them. Um, and assert your position, and an email is fine, of what you said at the meeting and what the position of the other parties were. This type of documentation is critical. Finally, what does your contract say about notice? Have you complied with the notice provisions in your contract? You, you typically have a certain amount of time to assert claims, um, to provide notice and opportunity to cure, uh, any specific documents uh, that are required may need to be sent to a certain person or address via certified mail. Have you complied with all of those notice provisions? It would, it would be a shame that you would have done everything right, but a court may determine later that your contract required that you know, a certain notice be sent within seven days and it has to go via certified mail and you didn't do it and you could jeopardize your legal position uh, for something so small. Don't take those issues for granted because a court or a jury may may find those issues to be significant enough um, that it could impact your legal rights. And finally, get ready for a fight. Um, stopping work and demobilizing is a very drastic move. Um, and we suggest that if at all possible, if you could financially avoid this step, that you you try to avoid it. Um, and the main reason is, is that you give, you give the owner um, or the contractor almost a blank check to uh, finish the job and back charge you significantly. We have a client now, a different client who is also an electrician, who was um, terminated from a, a job over non-payment and a dispute about what was happening. It was a $2 million job. Uh, for the electri electrical scope of work. And as a result, the contractor made a claim on our client, the electrician's performance bond, um, and didn't pay them about $400,000 worth of work that our client had already performed. Between the amount left to complete the job in the contract, plus the $400,000 they didn't pay them, plus the claims on the performance bond, um, the contractor has ample funds to finish this job with someone else. They're tracking all the work. They're paying nearly two or three times uh, what our client was paying for labor. Um, they're buying materials as needed rather than on order, so they're more expensive. But the contractor doesn't care because they they have ample funds to finish this job using the money in the contract from our contractor. So be very careful about picking up and leaving because it creates this significant back charge issue that's gonna come back, potentially come back and bite you. Uh, and it's very important that you consult with an experienced legal uh, counsel first. Don't wait till after you leave. So this last example, um, our client was terminated in September of last year. Um, it's April now. Uh, he hired us a month ago. He should have picked up the phone and, and called us in um, June, July, August, before 
the issues uh, culminated in September. So he waited too long. There's very little we can do after the fact. Um, so don't delay in getting uh, a experienced attorney in construction to help you. And then get ready for the legal fight. If you're going to move down this path, you need to make sure that you um, are prepared for what is to come. And again, if you meet with a experienced construction attorney, they will be able to lay out for you what is ahead so that you can go into it with your eyes open. Again, it may not change the decision that you make, but at least it's better to know um, what the road ahead looks like rather than um, assuming that you have rights that you may not. So if you have any questions, now's the time to go ahead and submit them. Uh, and we'll go ahead and answer those in just a minute. In the meantime, while I look for questions here, let me make a, a tell you about two things. So number one is we have a weekly podcast on the Lean Zone, uh, and uh, it's little tidbits. Typically, our podcasts are anywhere from five to fifteen minutes long. We pick a topic and we um, we talk about it. Uh, and you can, if you listen to podcasts, you can get them on iTunes, Google Play. Stitcher or wherever you get your uh, podcasts. We have these webinars that we do every month. Our next webinar is titled Working for a Tenant, Follow These Steps to Get Paid. We'll go through the steps that you need to secure your lien rights and get paid on tenant improvement work. And we'll also talk about some of the risks associated with doing tenant improvement work and where your lien may not be as good as you think it is. That's on May 16th uh, from 9 to 9.20. We do a live seminar, a deep dive into liens, bonds, and contract issues uh, several times a year throughout South Florida. Our next one is on May 21st from 8 to 11 at the Courtyard Miami West in Miami, Florida. You can go to sunraynotice.com forward slash education and sign up for all of our free webinars and our live events. Um, okay, we have one question. Um, will the slides be available for later review? Um, absolutely. So if you would like a copy of this presentation, um, shortly after the webinar, we will post this on YouTube. But if you'd like the actual slides, just send me an email, and I'm happy to send them to you uh, right after the webinar. So my contact information is Alex Barthet, uh, and my email is alex at Barth at B is in boy, A R T H E T dot com. Send me an email and we'll go ahead and, and I'll go ahead and send you the uh, slides right after the presentation. Thank you everybody for attending the presentation. If you have any other questions, send them to me via email and I hope you have a great day.